Welcome to this Revival Animal Health webinar on dog C-sections. We are excited to have Dr. Marty Greer, Director of Veterinary Services at Revival Animal Health joining us today. Dr. Greer has more than 39 years of experience in veterinary medicine with special interests in pediatrics and reproduction. So in this webinar, Dr. Greer will be talking about managing mom and the puppies when a C-section is needed. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Marty Greer. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, and thanks for having me. Um, we're gonna go through a lot of material today, just like we usually do. I have a tendency to speak quickly, put a lot of materials into a fairly dense, cond condensed version. So um, listen fast, but remember, you can go back and see this again. Um, I just thought I'd throw this introdu introductory picture in here. This is what my yard looks like this week. Um, no, this is not one litter of puppies, thank goodness. Um, so these are my two litters right now, and if you know me, you know what breeds they are. If you don't know me, then you're not going to be able to tell. But these, uh, the black ones are Pembroke Welsh Corgis tricolors. They'll all have red heads when they're done growing up. So I have five of those, and then I have four, but there are only three in the picture, Danish Swedish farm dogs. And as you can see, the Danish Swedish farm dog on the right is the smart one because she found the bowl that's entirely hers. Uh, so she, she can chow down. So we're gonna go through this material today and going forward, we're gonna have other materials for you as well. So please let us know what you're interested in, what you wanna hear about and um, how we can best address your needs so that we can um, attend to those questions that you have. So we're gonna to talk today about managing your uh, bitches C-section. So what we're gonna talk about today is decision-making before your C-section. When is a C-section recommended? what the emergency C-section looks like, preparing for the C-section, anesthesia at C-section, which of course is your veterinarian's choice, but I think it's important that you are conversational in this, the surgical procedure itself, puppy resuscitation, and going home with your new litter, some tips and tricks to all of these. So I wanna start off with saying to not be afraid of C-sections. It's safer now than it's ever been. If your uh, veterinary clinic uses IV fluids, we have better and safer and faster anesthetic procedures. The earlier we intervene, the better this goes. Uh, so if we don't wait too long to get into there and help the puppies, um, how to plan a C-section, that really makes a big difference. And then getting more live puppies from a C-section than from free whelping is the truth. So we're gonna talk about those things. So remember at the beginning, don't cry. Number one, it ruins your makeup. And number two, you can't see the puppies. And I do have clients that come in and they, they come in with a female in labor and we talk to them and we say, you know, we really think you're gonna need a C-section today. And they break down and they start crying because either they've had a bad experience or a previous a veterinary clinic, a, a friend of theirs has been someplace and they've had a bad experience. So we wanna make sure that I give you the information today that allows you to have a really great experience at C-section and to go home with a healthy litter and a healthy mom. Okay, so decision-making before the C-section. When is a C-section recommended? When should it be planned? And when is it an emergency? So planning is a lot easier if we've done progesterone timing at the time of the breeding. So as we've talked about before, this is Dr. Doolittle and his push me, pull you. And what I wanna do with this animal is to remind us that timing at the beginning of the breeding allows us to time the C-section. And I have a lot of people that are resistant to doing progesterone testing during the breeding because they say they don't need it, I'm okay, I know when she needs to be bred, I can get her pregnant. And remember, it's not just getting her pregnant, it's being able to keep her pregnant the right number of days, and it's being able to make sure that we can get her unpregnant at the time that we really need her to be unpregnant. So if you have a high-risk pregnancy, it's gonna be really important to know her due date before you get into the middle of the pregnancy. So by planning the C-section, by knowing the due date, we can really accurately assess if she has preterm labor, if she's sick, if something happens to the puppies. We have a pretty good handle on when she's actually due. But it's really great to plan these C-sections, especially if you have breeds that need to have a scheduled C-section. That would be the bullies, the American bulldogs, the bulldogs, the English bulldogs, the pugs, the Frenchies, the Pembroke Welsh Corgis, the Bernese Mountain Dogs. A lot of these breeds end up needing scheduled C-sections. So the things that we do at our hospital to improve the quality of our outcomes are 18 to 24 hours before the scheduled C-section, we give solumedrol, which is a steroid, it's given intravenously as an injection. 
And what that does is it improves the ability of the puppy's lungs to mature so that when they're born, they have better ability to breathe. We don't have an artificial surfactant that we can give to premature puppies like they have to premature babies. So we're really stuck with what the puppies have. So using solumedrol gives us the opportunity to mature those puppies' lungs. And then sometimes we'll give Reglan, which is also called metoclopramide. And the purpose of that is that that will improve the lactation of the bitch. So if you have a bitch that needs to have a C-section the day before she goes into labor, like a bulldog or a Frenchie, she's starting to lactate at the time that we have the puppies born and the time that we need to start them nursing. So you have colostrum on board at the time of birth. The day of the C-section, prior to the time that we anesthetize the female, we give atropine, which is a drug that's given by injection by veterinarians to keep the puppies and the female's heart rate at a high enough level that they have successful anesthesia. And uh, atropine will cross the placenta. There is also a drug called glycopyrrolate. So for those of you on the veterinary team, you may use glycopyrrolate to keep the heart rates up, but that does not cross the placenta. So I like using atropine because if we have puppies that are starting to get into trouble and their heart rates are dropping, atropine can keep them beating and circulating their blood effectively before we can get them born. Um, additionally, we give calcium injections, and that does two things. One is it improves the contractility of the uterus. So at C-section, the uterus contracts down better. We have less bleeding, less metritis, less of a problem with concerns about pieces of placenta that might be left, getting left behind. It also improves the maternal skills of the bitch. So that seems to um, make her a better mom when she leaves your hospital. So it's important that we're giving all these drugs so that we have the bitch well prepared for going home with her litter of puppies and the puppies well prepared. So what if we have an unplanned but a scheduled C-section and that happens to us. We have people that come in and they um, didn't think they were gonna need a C-section but they come in for their puppy count x-ray and they find out they have 14 puppies. Uh, they come in and they find out that the female had something happen like she injured her back or she injured her neck during her pregnancy and they don't really want her to go into labor and have to turn and twist and do all the things that um, bitches do when they're um, in labor and producing puppies. So sometimes we end up doing a scheduled C-section, but it wasn't planned to be scheduled at the beginning. So without timing, that makes it a little bit more difficult. So the things that we use for that are gonna be called a reverse progesterone. That's when we do progesterones at the end of the pregnancy instead of at the beginning of the heat cycle. And we want to see a progesterone lower than three, preferably before two, below two, before we start to go to C-section. That just assures us that the puppies will be mature and ready to breathe when they are born. And then the other thing we use for timing in our hospital is ultrasound. And ultrasound can be really useful in assessing whether the puppies are mature enough to be born. So I'm gonna show you videos of ultrasound here in just a couple of minutes so that you have a handle on what that looks like. So remember I said that progesterone timing can be really helpful at the beginning so that we know exactly when we want to do our C-section because believe it or not, veterinarians do not have a crystal ball. So we know from our progesterone testing that we've been doing for over 20 years that timing is everything, not just for getting her pregnant, but for getting her unpregnant as well. So if we time from ovulation, we know how many days a bitch should be pregnant and that's 63. So 61 days from ovulation, we do our C-sections on our bully breeds, the Frenchies, the English Bulldogs, um, the short face breeds, and 62 days for everybody else. So if I have a golden retriever with 10 puppies, she's gonna be on day 62. If I have a bulldog with two puppies, she's gonna be on day 61 from ovulation. Ovulation being progesterone of five. So we know reverse progesterones, that the um, C-section should be safe if the progesterone is less than three. And a lot of vet clinics now can do progesterones in-house in their own machines, so you can now get results back in less than an hour. Uh, we don't have to send them out at some of the hospitals because about 60% of vet clinics that have the um, IDEX catalyst machine can now run these in-house. Uh, we also look at skeletal maturity. So if we take a puppy count x-ray, we can see how mature the skeletons look. That can be a key. Ultrasound, looking at both gut motility and the development of the kidney can be key. Lactation, so if the bitch is lactating and if she's starting to nest, those are all keys that we're probably safe to go ahead and go to C-section. And I want as many of these stars to align as possible. I don't wanna just look at a progesterone. I wanna look at ultrasound. I wanna look at the date that she was bred. I want all this information to make sure that we're making great choices. So this video shows intestinal motility on an ultrasound of a puppy. So in the center of the screen, you can kind of see a bright white section, a little sort of um, linear section. And you can see it looks like there's some trickling of fluid. 
that is intestinal motility. So if your veterinarian has a great ultrasound machine and they're experienced at this, with ultrasound, you can look at the intestines and determine if that puppy is mature enough to be born. And then this is also an ultrasound. This is an ultrasound of the kidney. And again, right in the center of the screen, you can see some black, um, large areas. And not off to the right, but in the center. And that's, you see that thing that's sort of ov oval or oblong, that's a kidney. And you can look at a puppy that day 58, day 59, you cannot see their kidneys. You get to day 62 and boom, all of a sudden the kidneys just pop off the screen. So if your veterinarian isn't currently doing this, this is a great opportunity for you to take your bitches in that are due to have their puppies, maybe in labor, maybe before they go into labor and let them practice doing ultrasounds so that they can become more skilled at this. It takes some practice to get good at this. It's not something that all veterinarians are gonna be good at at the beginning. And they have to have a pretty good ultrasound machine. So um, please work with a veterinarian that's willing to learn these things and willing to work with an ultrasound machine with you. So when is a C-section recommended? We recommend it if we have large litters, small litters, certain breeds, maternal histories, and previous history. So if we have a large litter, we're gonna recommend a C-section. A large litter in my hospital is anything over nine puppies. So once we get up to 10, 14, 16 puppies, and we do have litters that big, we do recommend a C-section primarily because if we wait for all the puppies to be delivered, many times by the time we get down to puppy number nine or 10, the labor has been prolonged, the uterus has been contracting for a long time, and the blood flow is minimal to the puppies that are left behind, so they tend to not get the oxygen that they need and we start to have stillborn puppies. So before waiting until we have stillborns, we like to jump in there and get these puppies born as quickly as possible. If we have a really small litter, then we'll also recommend a C-section. For instance, today we just did a C-section in my hospital. It was a dachshund. She was pregnant with two puppies. If she'd had three or four puppies, she probably would have been just fine whelping on her own. But we worry with small litters two things. One is that the puppies may get too large for her to deliver. And number two is she may not go into labor at an appropriate time and the, the placenta may start to age out and not continue to deliver blood and oxygen to the puppies. The problem with small litters is um, labor is initiated in the bitch by the puppies, not by her ovaries saying it's time to go into labor. So if we have really small litters, they're not stressed, they don't have a lot of worry, they just wait in there for the um, stress levels to start to happen and the placentas can then start to deteriorate. And by the time we get to day 64, day 65 from the ovulation, those placentas aren't carrying blood to the puppies anymore. So if we have a small litter, we recommend a C-section. This is a pug. This is a litter of two pug puppies. Um, this semen was frozen semen that we used on this particular bitch. These puppies were born on Easter Sunday. Um, the family lived in Chicago. They didn't want to go to the emergency clinic on Easter. And um, this was the top producing pug dog of all time that had the last unit of semen left on him. So you can bet that we weren't gonna wait for this female to go into heat, get into trouble, and end up at an emergency clinic in the middle of the night where they weren't gonna get the kind of care they needed for a C-section. And if you haven't experienced anything quite yet with COVID, I'm gonna tell you right now that emergency clinics are in general really overwhelmed by the caseload. Uh, their staff is frequently a smaller staff than they are used to having. And we're really struggling in veterinary medicine right now to get the number of staff members and the ability to get the number of clients in that we need to. So our local emergency clinic is telling us sometimes there's a four to six hour wait to see the doctor. So please be aware of that. Don't wait until you're in trouble and then call your local emergency clinic and find out that they're not gonna be able to accommodate your needs. So plan a little bit more ahead going forward than you've had to in the past because things have changed during COVID. The other reasons that we may want to do a C-section would be maternal history. That would be if the female has a history of not being a good um, bitch in labor. I had a client that called the other day. He'd had a, a German Shepherd. She was the most active German Shepherd you could possibly imagine. During her first labor, she delivered four puppies, quit on number five. We went in to get number five out. This time she quit after one puppy and I said to him, have you given calcium? Yes. Have you given oxytocin? Yes. And he said, you know what? I'm on puppy one. I've got five to go. I'm not going to wait. I'm coming now. So I appreciate someone that thinks ahead and realizes that if they have a bitch that's just not a good whelper, I mean, she's fit. She's active. She's an amazingly active athletic dog. Labor's just not her thing. 
So be able to plan ahead. If the bitch has had a pelvic fracture or some kind of trauma, she's going to have narrowing of her birth canal and not be able to deliver puppies. If she has a vaginal stricture or hyperplasia, those polyps that protrude from the vagina, those are going to be in the way during labor. So um, have her checked with a finger exam prior to the time of the breeding and prior to the time of the whelping to see if there's enough room for a puppy. If you can only get one finger in there, I'm going to guess your puppies are bigger around than that. So you probably want to start planning for a C-section. We also recommended if the sem semen is very limited, it's the last frozen semen in existence on a dog. If the bitch has been diagnosed with herpes during her pregnancy, she's at increased risk of uh, passing herpes to the puppies if they're born vaginally, so we recommend a C-section. If we look at the size of the puppies on an x-ray or a position of a puppy and it's really uh, obvious that that puppy's not going to come out through the birth canal, like it's C-shaped and it's trying to come out shoulder first, just go to C-section. Don't think you can reposition the puppy. Or if the bitch has been ill with diabetes, she's had an injury, something that should interfere with her ability to have a good healthy labor, you may just want to go ahead and schedule the C-section. So those are all the things that we want to talk about. So dystocia, a dystocia is the word that we use, whether it's a human or an animal. It's the inability of a female to the, expel a fetus without assistance. The average number of dogs that have this is about 5%, but we get into English bulldogs, French bulldogs, it's around 90%. And what you do really need to know is that 75% of the time, if we have a dystocia, it's due to the bitch, and 25% is because of the fetus. So we're gonna talk about the differences in those. In maternal causes, it can be that she has uterine inertia, really common in greater Swiss mountain dogs, Bernese mountain dogs, and certain other breeds like that German Shepherd. Her uterus didn't contract well. So that accounts for almost 50% of the times that we go to C-section. Partial uh, uterine inertia accounts for 23%, meaning that she just didn't have effective contraction. She had some. 1% would be a narrow bony birth canal. So either she was made funny when she was developing or she had a pelvic fracture. Uterine torsions account for 1%. That's when one uterine horn flips over the other and the puppies just can't get down and engage into the cervix and initiate good labor. Hydroallantoasis hydrops, that's when the uh, bitch has an excessive amount of fluid in her uterus that overstretches the uterus. The uterus can't effectively contract because it's so large, it doesn't have good contractions. So in those cases, then we wanna make sure that we take those females in. Sometimes you can tell on ultrasound, sometimes you can just tell by looking at the puppies. Um, that or the the bitch that the that the uterus and the belly looks more distended than it should for her, the number of puppies that are in there vaginal septums those happen a half of the percent of the time so it's not very common but again that is a possibility that you have something abnormal in the vagina that um, she has two parts to the vagina or a septum or some stricture in the vagina that interferes with her ability to deliver puppies so that accounts for 75 percent of the dystocias 25 percent are because of the fetus so that's when a puppy's in an odd position. I've had them come out shoulder first. I've had them come out where they mo open their mouth and their jaw is now open. And so it catches the jaw on the vagina. And so they can't deliver the puppy. Uh, so there's a lot of weird things that puppies can do. Sometimes they'll come down one horn and instead of coming into the cervix, they'll take a wrong turn and head back north. So they'll end up with their head in one uterine horn and their body in the other. And so of course they can't deliver them shoulder first. 6% of the time, it's an oversized puppy. That's a puppy that's just too large to fit through the birth canal. We did a C-section last Saturday that we had boxer puppies that were 22 ounce puppies. They were just too big for the bitch. 1% um, of the time is a malformation. And that's when a puppy is maybe um, a, a walrus puppy, a puppy that's got some other defect with the way it's made and it's simply not gonna fit through the birth canal. It's not gonna be able to come down um, effectively. 1% of the time the puppies are already dead and um, they lose the fluid from around them and they just don't have enough lubrication to effectively come through the birth canal. So this is all information from Sweden from 1994, some research that was done there. But it gives us a pretty good idea of what all the reasons are. So there's, there's oftentimes a reason, but sometimes we cannot diagnose it before we go to surgery. So if you end up with dystocia, you can ask your veterinarian if they were able to determine the cause. If it's a fetal cause, it probably won't happen on the next C-section or the next pregnancy. If it's a maternal cause, she's still the same dog. If she was a bulldog when you bred her the first time, she's still going to be a bulldog the second time. So you're not going to change that. So if that's the case, you're going to end up simply doing a C-section every time. Now, just because she had a C-section doesn't mean she has to have one every single time that goes forward. So if your veterinarian is careful and... Um, 
puts the incision in the uterus where the female can deliver puppies the next time and it won't interfere with the development of future pregnancies. You don't have to necessarily do a C-section every time unless it was a maternal cause. It was a fetal cause like the uterine a horn had, had flipped, that's kind of random. If it's a malformation of a puppy, an oversized puppy, you'll probably be okay. And in humans, they call those VBACs, that's vaginal birth after C-section, VBAC. So we can do the same in dogs. They're not at risk of uterine rupture. So it's okay to go ahead and have a C-section one time and not on the subsequent uh, pregnancies. So puppy position, 60% of the time, puppies should come out of the uterus head first. That's normal. But it's also normal 40% of the time to come back feet first. That is not a breech delivery. A breech delivery is when the tail is um, coming and the, the back feet are forward. So you're getting actually just the rump of the puppy, not the entire rear end of the puppy with legs. That's a breech. Those are not common, but back feet first is common 40% of the time. If you look at cows and sheep and horses, they have a, a narrow head and very long front legs. Those animals have to be born head first. But puppies and kittens and pigs are kind of torpedo shaped. They're rounded on both ends. So it's absolutely normal for 40% of the time them to come out back feet first. So that's not anything to get excited about. When I say dorsal ventral, that's the third item on this slide. That's when the puppy is being born instead of belly down toward the floor, it's belly up. So during birth, that puppy cannot flex its back and normally come through that birth canal. So frequently we'll see um, that create a dystocia. Head deviation means that they're not coming with their head forward, they're coming with shoulder forward. That doesn't work real well. Oversized puppies, birth defects, all these are, are possible causes. So that just gives you an idea of different positions of the puppies. So what happens if we have an emergency C-section, if our bitch is in labor and she either never delivers the first puppy or gets part of the way through the pregnancy and the delivery and doesn't finish delivering puppies, that's when we need to do an emergency C-section. So I have clients that will ask me, why are puppies born dead? Like why was puppy number eight a stillborn? And it can be prolonged labor. It can be a dystocia, which needed uh, a female that needed help. It can be a stressed female where she's just really frantic and there's poor blood flow to the uterus because she's running around and she's upset about the way the position of the puppy is happening and she's not able to relax enough to let the blood flow to the uterus. Um, at uh, the time that they come in for a dystocia, all of my bitches that are in labor go immediately on IV fluids. That helps to improve the blood flow to the uterus and to the puppies. So it's important that we have them on IV fluids during labor. Uh, if we're trying to do a managed delivery at the veterinary clinic or if she goes to C-section, it's just really important that we get an IV catheter in and give her fluids. IV fluids are much better than sub-Q fluids. So don't forget that that's really a big difference. So if your vet says, I'd like to put it in IV, tell them yes, let's get out of the way. Um, anesthetic, inappropriate anesthetic protocols, we're going to talk about that in a little bit more detail, but that's research from Paula Moon. Genetic abnormalities, of obviously, um, genetic abnormalities and inborn defects of metabolism, there's nothing we can do to prevent those. If, if we have puppies that have something wrong with them, it's just the way it is. So sadly, those puppies cannot be saved or revived. And then there can be infectious causes. So we can see infections like herpes virus that happened to the bitch during a pregnancy. She may just have mild kennel cough, but the, the puppies can be profoundly affected and be born dead because of something like herpes. We can see bacterial infections that get up through the cervix and into the uh, uterus and the bitch can have a septic pregnancy. So there's a lot of reasons that puppies are born dead. Some of these we can control, like how long her labor is and how stressed she is in giving her fluids what kind of anesthetics we use, some of them we cannot. So we do our very best, but sometimes in spite of our best efforts, we don't always have the outcomes, the great outcomes that we're hoping for. So if we are doing an emergency C-section, we know that um, our outcomes are definitely better if the surgery is not an emergency. We know that our outcomes for puppy survival are better if the bitch is not a brachycephalic, meaning a bulldog, a French bulldog. We know we have better outcomes if there are four puppies or less in the litter if there are no deformed puppies, if all the puppies breathe spontaneously or one vocalized spontaneously. And then we're gonna talk about anesthetics. So back in the old days, we used to use methoxyfluorine as a gas. That is not recommended. Neither is ketamine, 
xylazine, which is rompin, dextomator, which um, is frequently used in other anesthetic protocols, but is never appropriate during a C-section. So you want to talk to your veterinarian if this is somebody you routinely use before you end up in the middle of the night in a crisis about what anesthetic agents they use, because we're going to tell you what ones are the best. So the question then is, does she need a C-section? And the answers are, don't wait too long. So make sure that you're thinking ahead. How many puppies are left? Like the guy that had five puppies still inside and the German Shepherd and she'd only delivered one. Let's go to surgery now while we still have good, healthy puppies. What's her condition? If she becomes distressed or in any kind of trouble, we want to make sure that we're not waiting so long that she's in trouble. We had a bitch that presented here in April who had a glucose of 23 and a calcium of eight. This dog was in a preeclampsia situation. She was in big trouble. So we had to give her good supportive care so that we could deliver her puppies. Um, has she responded to oxytocin? That's an important question is, have you given some? And, and we're not going to talk much about oxytocin today, but I am going to say most people tend to give too much too often. So be really careful. And we do already have a presentation about oxytocin use. So I don't want to go into details. What time of the day is it? So don't wait until 15 minutes before your vet clinic closes to call and say, I think I'm in trouble. Call them at one o'clock in the afternoon. Don't wait until quarter to six and say, you know, you don't mind if you stay late, do you? Because you know what? Everybody thinks they have a vet that'll be willing to stay late for them. And that gets really hard on the staff after a while to stay late every single night. They have families and they have other lives too. And what alternatives do you have to your care? So do you have an emergency clinic that's nearby that can accommodate you? Are you out in the boonies or are you at a place that the emergency clinics are so overwhelmed that they can't manage your C-section? So don't wait until you're up against the wall and have no options left. So when is an emergency C-section needed? Well, if whelpwise, if you're using whelpwise and they can see that the fetal heart rates are starting to decline below 160, you need a C-section. If you're using WELPWISE, which is a uterine contraction monitoring service, and they say the uterine contraction patterns are not effective, you need a C-section. If there's been more than two hours from the last puppy, you need a C-section. If you have puppies that are being born dead, don't wait for another puppy to be born dead. Go to the vet, get a C-section. Or if you go in and there's an x-ray or an ultrasound that suggests that there's a problem with the presentation or the viability of the puppies, get a C-section. So don't wait until there's only three dead puppies left. That's no fun for anybody. It's not fun for your staff. It's not fun for the veterinarian. It's not fun for you. So if you get the feeling something's not right, you need to go in and get these diagnostics done so you know. When else is an emergency C-section needed? If you see green vaginal discharge before the first puppy is born, that means there's placental separation. Now, clearly after the first puppy, you do have placental separation. So green discharge between puppies is normal. Green discharge before the first puppy, green means go at my hospital. So if you see green, that means you call right now, you come in right now, and we're going to have your dog on the table in 30 minutes. Um, that includes time to get the catheter in, get the blood work done, get the EKG done, and get everything prepped and ready to go. So... You, you need to have a veterinary clinic that's able to do this for you. When else do you need an emergency C-section? Well, if you've planned in advance and it fell apart, like she was supposed to have her C-section on Friday, but Thursday she decided to go into labor, well, then it's an emergency. If you have fetal distress or maternal distress, you have an emergency. Or I trust my clients. If they have this feeling that they call me and say, I don't know, Dr. Greer, I just, I just feel like something's wrong. I believe them because they know their bitches. They know what their previous litter was like. If they don't feel like something's going the way it should be, I might get in the car, get a box for the puppies, get in the car and come now. I don't care that you're in your pajamas. I don't care that you didn't have supper. Just get in the car and let's go. So the things that you can do as the owner of the dog for preparation are going to be knowing her due date based on progesterone timing, giving her a bath using chlorhexidine shampoo before the C-section, two or three days before, so that she's clean, she has no bacteria or limited bacteria in her skin, you've gotten the fecal material off. Sometimes we have a little bit of um, shaving done along the mammary chain. If you know you're going to have a fuzzy dog like a golden retriever or corgi, it can be helpful to get her groomed up ahead of time. Have your supplies packed up, the stuff you want to travel with, the blankets, the daily mucus trap, the bulb syringe. Don't wait until you're calling your vet saying, I think I'm in trouble. Have the organizational system that you can throw stuff into a box and be out of your house in three minutes. Um, make sure you have gas in your car. Like I've had clients call me and say, I'm going to have to stop and buy gas. 
really, you have a pregnant dog and it's January and you didn't think having a full tank of gas was a good idea? You need to plan ahead. Get plenty of sleep before it um, so that you're well rested when you take your dog home. I use a lot of Thunderese collars or Adapto collars. Those are the pheromone collars. They're not lavender. They're actually pheromones. They're the hormone that a bitch makes in her placental fluids and in her mammary glands. It's calming to the puppies. It's calming to the bitch. So get those collars on them. I, if I'm scheduling a C-section, I put those on the bitches three days before they're due. Make sure she's fasting. So don't feed her right up until the minute that she goes into labor. If you know her due date is coming. Now, you sometimes can't tell, and feeding can be a useful tool in determining if they're ready to go into labor or not, because some will stop eating. But if you're scheduled a C-section, especially if you have a bully breed, don't feed her right before you go to the vet. And then the Breeders Edge Oxy Mama product is an herbal product that helps bitches to lactate. So these are some really simple, basic things that you can do at home that are going to make a big difference in your outcomes. What should the veterinary clinic be doing and what do you expect at the vet clinic? Number one, they're gonna to need to do blood work and an EKG if they do those at their hospital before she goes to surgery, just to make sure she's healthy and stable and that the C-section will go well. We'll do an ultrasound, like I said, to look at the puppies for maturity and to check heart rates. If puppy heart rates are below 160, I'm running to the surgery room. I'm not, you know, like I'm gonna knock everybody else out of the way and say, I'm sorry, I know you had an appointment for a vaccination this afternoon, but I'm gonna take this dog to C-section first because if I know I'm in trouble, I'm gonna go. And we've already talked about the intestinal motility and the kidney development on ultrasound to know that the puppies are mature. The bitch needs to be on IV fluids, period, in a discussion that shouldn't even be a negotiable at your vet clinic. They should put in an IV catheter and start fluids and you should not complain about that. Um, for the short-faced dogs, sometimes we'll give some oxygen by face mask in advance of the C-section. Some bitches will fight that, some tolerate it pretty well. It's a good way to get better oxygenation to the puppies while she's in labor. Metoclopramide is Reglan. That will improve not only her lactation, it'll help her make milk better, but it'll also make it less likely that she'll vomit at the time that she's put under anesthesia. So that can be helpful. Before we put our bitches under anesthesia, we shave their bellies. I don't want them on the table under anesthesia any longer than absolutely necessary. As soon as she's out, I want to start getting puppies delivered, so I have her shaved in advance. Um, I have a C-section team. I have a group of people on my team that know exactly how they need to work and what they need to do. They're very skilled in puppy resuscitation. We have checklists in our hospital, just like the airlines, the pilots. We have a checklist so that we know exactly what has to be set up in advance. Um, the staff will say, yeah, I know, I, I know what I'm supposed to get out. I, yeah, I know you do. But sometimes when you're in a hurry, it can be hard to remember everything. So just get that checklist going. Um, your veterinary clinic should be fast. They shouldn't, like I said, sit there for three or four hours. If you go in and you say, I want a C-section, they should be responsive to that and get things going. You need to make sure your females get a tube in her trachea at the time she's anesthetized. There are still clinics that do these without endotracheal tubes. Um, the endotracheal tube does two things. One is it delivers gas and oxygen to the female. And two, it will protect her airway if she does have any vomiting or regurgitation under anesthesia because of the weight of the pregnancy. We don't want her to aspirate any stomach content, so it's really important that we have an endotracheal tube controlling her airway and keeping it open so that she's oxygenated. And we never, ever, ever, ever spay at C-section, ever. So I, I would really encourage you to make sure that you're not approving that, especially at an emergency clinic that doesn't know you well. They will sometimes have an agenda to say, if your bitch couldn't deliver puppies, she should never be bred again. I'm going to spay her right now. Don't let that happen. So this is our old clinic. This is the one we moved out of 12 years ago. And it's a tiny little itsy bitsy, tiny little clinic. It was 1,200 square feet. But we were able to effectively have a surgery room that had all of our setup, our incubator, our anesthetic machine, our patient monitor, everything in it, uh, so that we could do a really great job with our C-sections. This is my um, puppy resuscitation area. This was treatment where we would frequently do dentals and minor procedures, but this is it set up for a C-section. So if you're working with a vet that has a little tiny office, this can still work. In the background, you can see our autoclave, our surgery room is off to the left, the centrifuge, the cages. It's a little tiny building, but we were able to really effectively use the space because we were pretty organized. My staff was awesome. Surgery pack. Um, and of course, we're gonna talk about the supportive care during the surgical procedure. So the female needs to be on a monitor of some type so that you can make sure that she is safe. She's got a beating heart. She's got a good SpO2. She's got good respirations. 
Um, at our C-sections, we use colored towels, and we'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. Um, I use gauze that has a blue line through it so that if something inadvertently would get left, and so far we've never done that, left behind you can see the gauze on x-ray. I count my instruments before and after I'm done with my procedure to make sure nothing got left behind. I want to make sure I have daily mucus straps available, and I have an incubator. So this is an emergency C-section. This is a bitch that came into us. She had had eight puppies at home. The client called me and she said, you told me there were nine on the x-ray. And I said, that's because there are nine on the x-ray. And she said, are you sure? I said, I'm sure. She said, are you sure you're sure? I said, I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure. She said, well, I'm supposed to leave for my national tomorrow morning and I'm going to leave the bitch and the puppies with my husband. I said, not until you come in tonight and get that last puppy out. She's like, okay. So this is a Malamute. This is an emergency C-section. She looks a little nervous. Um, this is a bulldog. Obviously, this is not a Malamute. But just so you kind of get an idea, we set up on our table, we have a, an IV catheter in. Here the uh, technical staff is anesthetizing and putting a tube into the trachea of the bulldog. Here the bulldog is on the table. We put them left side down so that we can keep pressure of the uterus on the spleen and not on the aorta. It improves blood, blood flow. Here we are hooking her up to a monitor to IV fluids and to her gas anesthetic. Here is our instrument. Uh, pack and our colored towels, which like I said, we'll talk about. This is my C-section report, so we can very carefully chart where in the uterus your female or your puppies were, and obviously number 22 should be number 11. Um, so this is enough for 15 puppies. So we mark on the report who delivered the puppy, what color towel they were in, and we mark on the, the Y-shaped item on the left side where the puppy was in the uterus. And this is the colored towel system that we use in our hospital. The reason we do this is so we can chart exactly where in the uterus the puppies were, but we can also uh, chart who needed resuscitative efforts and who's, who was able to breathe spontaneously. And that's important when you go back and look at our neonatal uh, PowerPoint that we did on the Learning Center or the YouTube channel. You can see that if we have puppies that are harder to resuscitate or that have some other issues, then we know that we need to monitor them more closely and more carefully. So we um, have everybody born into a colored towel, and then they are marked with a corresponding color of nail polish so that as an owner, you can go home knowing which puppy needed help and which puppy didn't need help, which ones are okay. So we have one sterile and one non-sterile set of towels. They're all bundled together in Ziploc bags, very high tech. Um, so I have a sterile towel that's handed to me by a te uh, technician at the time that we're delivering the puppies. Um, they carry the puppy out to the resuscitation area. When that towel gets too wet, too soggy, then we switch it out for a dry towel and we can keep them in the same towel. Um, it also works really well if I have one experienced and one inexperienced person resuscitating puppies. The inexperienced person can do a good job of resuscitating a healthy puppy Puppy, and then the more experienced people can take over and we can keep track of who got dopram, who got caffeine, who needed the daily mucus trap, who breathed on their own, who was spontaneously breathing, what they weighed, uh, what their placenta weighed, all the information that we want at the time that we are delivering puppies. Um, I use fingernail polish. Some people will use neck bands as identification, but there are different ways to do it. At C-section, I use a clear adhesive drape on my bitches. The reason being that then we don't have to scrub their nipples with chlorhexidine, which is our surgical scrub. That makes their nipples taste bad, but it also makes it harder for puppies to find the nipple. There was a study done in rat pups that if the nipples weren't scrubbed, the rat pups were better able to find the nipples. And we've been doing this for, gosh, probably eight years. And I think it does improve the maternal bonding of the puppy to the mom because they have an easier time finding the nipples. So I use these adhesive drapes. Um, they can be purchased sterilely and be used at your veterinary clinic. So this is uh, the instrument tray, the incision. This is the uterine horn with the puppy in it. This is that single puppy that you see, the, the Malamute. This is what a uterine horn looks like. You can see that kind of green um, train track looking stripe down the uterus. That's where a previous incision was from a previous C-section. That's completely normal, not anything to worry about, but it is an interesting variation so that you know what that looks like. Here's the puppy being delivered out of the uterine horn. We take the placenta out at the same time. This is a bulldog puppy. This is Alyssa catching a puppy into the sterile colored towel. And then this is a litter of puppies we delivered that was a litter of 16 Springer puppies. 
<coughs> so you can see with the colored towel system, it makes it a lot easier for us to keep track of who was where and who got re which resuscitation. Here we are back to um, delivering the puppy and then managing the post uh, puppy. So this is Sloopy. This is the little Malamute puppy that decided she wasn't going to be born without a C-section. These are bulldog puppies in my, C in my incubator, my old incubator. And this is Hang On Sloopy. So because we knew that this bitch was pregnant with nine puppies, she didn't leave for her national. We had the last puppy born by C-section and all nine puppies were successfully raised. If she had left for her national and left her husband in charge and he didn't realize that the bitch was still pregnant with a puppy, this could, could have gone really bad. Not only could she have lost the puppy, but she could have lost the bitch as well. So this is her with her litter of nine puppies. We do allow our clients back into the C-section and resuscitation area. This is one of my clients working with one of his bulldog puppies to get her started nursing. So we talked about the adhesive drape as a way to improve maternal bonding. Um, the Thunder East collar, like I said, that's the adapto collar or the pheromone collar that emits the pheromone that uh, the bitch should uh, elicit from her placental fluids and her mammary glands. That improves her ability to nurse and that improves the puppy's ability to be calm. So using that um, can be really helpful. I put those on if we're scheduled a C-section three days before. If we are not scheduled, I'll go ahead and put the collar on as soon as they come in the door and we're planning a C-section. Uh, I usually send home placental fluid. I don't usually send home placentas. Every now and then I have a client that wants one in a Ziploc bag to take home with them, and that's okay with me. But placental fluid is really useful because you can take that home with you after the C-section and put that on the puppies, both on their head and their rumps. Then they don't smell like Tide or Era laundry soap. They smell like the mom and the placenta. So it does improve the, the bitch's ability to recognize that those are her puppies. Um, oxytocin doesn't just help with milk letdown. It also improves maternal bonding. Uh, bitches need calcium orally and oxytocin to improve their ability to be good moms. So if we give oxytocin by injection or by nasal spray and we give calcium orally and the gel that you can see in this picture is the most effective and the fastest working product of calcium other than injectable, those two together will improve maternal bonding. Sometimes you'll have some bitches that are kind of snarky toward their puppies. I actually had one of my own do that and the puppies were born vaginally. So every now and then you'll get that. It doesn't happen often, but it is important to know how to respond to that if it does occur. So get calcium into her, get some oxytocin into her. If she has had a C-section, please, please, please take home pain medication for your dog. Don't tell your vet you don't need it. Don't tell him she's fine without it. I will tell you they're better moms. They're more relaxed. They lactate better. They let the puppies crawl around on them much more effectively if they've had a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory or pain medication after her surgery. I always give an injection at the time that the last puppy is born and then we send home a three-day supply with the bitches. Um, I use Medicam, you can use Rimadil. There's good ones on the market. I've been using those products for close to 21 years and have never looked back. Every single time I've done it, I've been glad I have. The bitches are better moms. I've never had a puppy go into kidney failure because of it. I've never had a bitch get into trouble because of it. I will tell you, it makes a huge difference in her ability to be a good mom. So please, please, please ask your vet for non -steroidals. A lot of people use either tramadol or gabapentin. That can make them drowsy and make them more likely to lay on a puppy or step on a puppy. So get a good drug. But Rimadil and Medicam are safe. I've used them for two, three, four generations of dogs now and I'm not seeing any ne negative effects. So please ask for those. Bitches are not euphoric enough to say that they don't need a pain medication after a C-section. And then individual puppy care is really important that we're providing that so that each puppy has a chance to get up to the nipple and nurse effectively. So again, here's the adhesive drape. As far as anesthetic protocols, we had been using propofol for many years and um, about two and a half years ago switched over to Lofaxin. They're both a very short acting injectable anesthetic. They are super safe for the bitches, super safe for the puppies. So we do that until we get the puppies uh, or the bitch under anesthesia. And then we'll turn on gas anesthesia, either sevoflurane or isoflurane. They're both good anesthetic drugs. Um, and then, like I said, Rim Rimadil, Medicam, but probably not tramadol to go home for post-op. So Paula Moon in the year 2000 did a really nice study that involved 3,908 puppies out of 807 C-section delivered litters. She was a resident at Cornell 
at the vet school there during the time that she was collecting this data. And she sent out questionnaires to practices in veterinary schools and in private practice like ours. She sent them to 109 practices across the United States and Canada. And the data she got back um, was analyzed to determine how many puppies were surviving at birth, how many puppies were still alive two hours later, and how many puppies were alive seven days later. So her data very clearly showed across the board a five to 6% higher puppy survival rate if puppies were born by C-section than if they were born by vaginal delivery. So it's very clear that there's a big difference and a very successful um, way to do C-sections um, by using a C-section instead of vaginal birth. She did not tell anybody what anesthetic agents to use, but she did analyze what was used. And she determined that isoflurane, sevaflurane, and propofol were the safest. And this was done before alfaxin came to market. So I would include alfaxin enthusiastically on this list. But your veterinary clinic just really has to avoid the use of ketamine, the use of rompin, domator, and dextomator, which are alpha-2 antagonists. Um, they need to avoid methoxyflurane, which is an old anesthetic gas and they need to avoid using local anesthesia only. And believe it or not, there are still clinics that do C-sections with acepromazine and local anesthesia and no general anesthesia for the dogs. And that is just medically inappropriate in the year 2020. We just really need to have better control over our bitches' airways and their pain management during the delivery of puppies. So we wanna talk a little bit about puppy resuscitation. Um, I'm an enthusiastic and big fan of the puppy warmer incubator and the puppy warmer um, oxygen concentrator. We have very good success with these, and these are affordable enough that you can purchase these from Revival and have these at your own uh, kennel for raising puppies. So either at the time that they're born or if they end up with a sick puppy, this is really invaluable in saving puppies. Uh, again, this is uh, Alyssa, and you can see Heidi. They're using a daily mucus trap. To resuscitate a bulldog puppy, this is a way that we suction out the puppies uh, so that we can get the material out of their airway. This works differently than a bulb syringe. I alternate back and forth between a bulb syringe and a dealy. And when you are using a dealy mucus trap, you can see Heather in this picture is smiling. She is smiling because her dealy mucus trap isn't so full that she is now using that as a straw. So once you get about half full on the dealy mucus trap, you need to stop, take the top off, empty it, and then go back to using it again. So here's a little video clip of John using a daily mucus trap. And it's pretty intuitive. It's not hard to learn to use. Um, he's just doing a little bit of gentle um, stimulation and encouraging this puppy to start breathing. And all he's doing is just putting the daily mucus trap into the, the, the one tube is in his mouth, the other tube is in the puppy, just about an inch. And he's just giving the puppy some suction so that we get rid of the fluid in the airway and you can hear this puppy starts breathing. And next to him on the table, you can see the C-section report with a list of um, the, the puppies and what their birth order was, and then owners sitting in the background waiting for their puppies. During resuscitation, you wanna keep the puppies warm and safe. Don't let them roll off the table and onto the floor. Keep them warm with a heating pad or with a hot water bottle. If you're not sure if the puppies are breathing, uh, grab your stethoscope. You can get those for very little money on Revival Animal Health's website. And if you have a puppy with a curl to the tongue and you can hear a heartbeat, you wanna to continue to try resuscitative efforts. If you're unable to resuscitate with just the daily and the bulb syringe, you can use the GV26 acupuncture point, which you can do with a hypodermic needle and by stimulating the puppy by putting the needle into the nostril area, you can get that puppy to start breathing in many cases. If they're still not breathing at that point, I use caffeine tablets, and you can just buy these as no-dose tablets at any truck stop or Walmart. Uh, we just dissolve this into a cc of water, put a drop on the tongue, and then you can repeat it if you need to if the puppy continues to have irregular respirations. Dopram is an injectable product. It's a prescription item. It tends to be a little bit controversial, uh, but if the puppy after 10 minutes is still not breathing and you've cleared the airway and you've done everything else right, then we will do a 10th of a cc injection into the puppy's tongue. I only do that if it's a last resort. And if at that point the puppy's still not breathing, then my technician will intubate the puppy. Now this is a, an obviously an adult dog on the right hand side, but it shows the head position of how the endotracheal tube is placed. And then we use a very small tube that is made for puppy resuscitation uh, to intubate with. So you can see this puppy has a curl to the tongue. It's bright pink. This is a puppy that we wanna continue to work with. And using something as simple as a laryngoscope, 
uh, you can see Alyssa here is placing an endotracheal tube into this puppy. And again, if you are um, willing to take chocolate chip cookies to your vet clinic, they are most likely going to learn how to uh, resuscitate puppies and perhaps even intubate them, and then you can ventilate them from there. I don't have such great success with this product. I do have great success with the $10 Dealey mucus trap. So if you don't already have a Dealey, which is this little device, I should have put another picture in, sorry about that. If you don't have a Dealey already, these are about $10 in the catalog. Please go ahead and get one ordered so that the next time you have a litter of puppies, you are prepared for that. Because the Dealey will save lives, I will guarantee you, you will find $10 well spent. If a puppy is born with meconium, we'll send these guys home on antibiotics, usually clavamox drops. Meconium is the first fetal stool. You can see this bulldog puppy is bright yellow. It's supposed to be a white puppy. That's a sign of meconium. And the puppy on the right-hand side, you can see fecal material up on its shoulder. That's fecal material on my surgery table from the puppy. So one of the reasons we want to track puppies is so that if we do resuscitation and we find that they have antibiotics, or they find they have meconium, they go home on antibiotics. So they need to be monitored for weight gain. Puppies need to be monitored for resuscitation efforts. And we've talked in the past about APGAR scores. So we APGAR score all of our puppies. The lowest APGAR score you can get is a zero, which means that you don't have a heartbeat, you don't have any muscle tone, and the puppy's really flaccid and not breathing and not having a heartbeat, all the way up to a 10 APGAR score, which means the puppy was vigorous and was screaming on the way out. So I just want to reiterate the importance of pain medication, the importance of Reglan to improve lactation, oxytocin not only to improve lactation, but to improve the maternal bonding, the use of tincture of iodine for umbilical cord treatment, the use of dewormers during pregnancy and early uh, after the puppies are born, the importance of taking home the milk replacer and the feeding tube and bottle so that you're prepared to feed the puppies, and the importance of using kaolin and pectin, not the human kaopectate if you have puppies with diarrhea. And at some point after the puppies are born, mom's gonna have diarrhea, you're gonna have diarrhea, the puppies are gonna have diarrhea, somebody's gonna have diarrhea. So just have kaolin and pectin at home. Spaying her on the table at a C-section should never ever happen. It will not affect the production of milk. Bitches don't need their ovaries to lactate, but it is really important that we don't take out her uterus. She's gonna lose 30% or more of her blood volume at the time of a C-section if the uterus is taken out and she is spayed at the time. So it is really, really, really advised against to spay her at C-section. What I do wanna show you is what a resorption site looks like at C-section. This is the inside of a uterus. And those are those yellow plaques that you can see there. I've had veterinarians misinterpret those as pyometras. This is not a pyometra. This is where a resorption, where a puppy started to develop and then failed to complete its development before it um, developed bony structures in its legs and body. So this is not a pyometra. This is not an infection. You can culture this. You'll never grow anything. Just flesh out the uterus, sew her back up, send her home, let her keep her uterus. Do not spay at the C-section. And these are cirrhosal cysts. On the bottom of that picture, you can see a bunch of cysts. We see these really commonly, especially in Bernie's Mountain Dogs and Golden Retrievers that have previously had a C-section. Again, these are not any reason to spay a dog because this does not interfere with future fertility, with future breeding. Those are just normal structures that we see after a C-section has been done on those two breeds. So remember that it's important that you don't cut corners at C-section. There are no bargains in parachutes and C-sections. Don't buy a discount parachute and don't buy a discount C-section. It doesn't come cheap to get IV fluids, to have great staff, to have enough staff, to have the right anesthetic and to have appropriate drugs and anesthesia and post-op. So make sure that you know that a C-section isn't gonna be the cheapest surgery you've ever had done, but done well, it can be really, really important. We do encourage our puppies to nurse before they leave our hospital. And I do just wanna briefly go through a couple of things here on taking the puppies home. It's important that we take them home with the tincture of iodine, and this is the product that we carry at Revival that's an iodine and alcohol combination. So this will help dry up the cord and keep them from developing an infection in the cord. So please make sure you're dipping your cords. These are the scissors that we've developed so that you can have an appropriate scissor to cut the umbilical cord. When I say dip the cord, I really mean dip the cord. So in this case, what I want to do is take the bottle that I've taken out of the large bottle, put it into a small bottle. I put the tincture of iodine in the bottle. And when I say dip, I mean dip. So I will rotate the puppy and in completely encase the umbilical cord in tincture of iodine. That will keep the infection from happening. 
if your bitches are not um, eating and drinking well after their C-section, they're not going to lactate well. So starter mousse can be really helpful in getting her to drink. You can mix that with a bucket of water. You can give her sub-Q fluids to help encourage her to lactate. We also know that bratwurst, oatmeal, and sweet potatoes are used on the human side to improve lactation. We've talked before about using Reglan to improve lactation, so that does a good job of getting the milk to come in. That along with oxytocin, Reglan helps them make milk, oxytocin helps them let down their milk. So my dose for oxytocin is very, very small. We give a half to three units per dose, and we'll do that four to six times a day along with warm compresses to encourage lactation. And the Reglan dose, metoclopramide and Reglan are the same thing. That's a 0.3 milligram per kilogram, three times a day dose. It comes as an injectable, it comes as an oral liquid, and it comes as a tablet. So it comes in any of those three forms. Your veterinary clinic can have that either at their hospital or you can get it at a human pharmacy. And then Oxymama is the product that we carry at Revival that will improve lactation. A couple times we've talked about the calming collar. This is the box that it comes in. This is what it looks like. It's called Thunder Ease. And then I want to really emphasize the importance of oral calcium and injectable calcium, not only to improve delivery of the puppies, but to reduce the risk of eclampsia, which is low calcium in the bitch after she's had a litter of puppies and is nursing, to reduce her aggression toward her puppies and to reduce her aggression toward visitors. So calcium is a really important product. That gel works quickly and it works really well. Like I said, placental fluid is really helpful. Um, we usually also stimulate the inside of the cervix. When I'm doing a C-section, don't do, I just do this at home because you can't get in there um, adequately, but at the C-section, I usually reach down to the cervix and do a little stimulation because that seems to improve the maternal bonding when she wakes up. This is how my postpartum fluid goes home. Uh, the placenta fluid, I save some in a bowl at the C-section and put it in a bottle to send home and put on the puppy's head and rump so that the bitch recognizes those as her puppies. And some of our inexperienced bitches will be aggressive toward their own puppies. These are accidents that have happened to clients. So giving calcium, getting them on pain medication, using the Thunderese collar, and sometimes you simply have to physically separate the bitch and put her in a muzzle when she's with the puppies is you may just absolutely have to do that to keep the puppies safe. This is really tragic when it happens. So don't let her hurt her puppies. Be with her as long as you don't think she's safe. Make sure you don't overstress her by too many people and too many animals staring at her. Give her her space because postpartum stress can be really upsetting to the bitch. So I just want you to all have really good outcomes at C-section, really good outcomes at vaginal deliveries. And I want to thank you all for coming today. Sorry we ran a little bit over. Um, we can have you stay on as long as you can for questions. But if you have to go, we'll get those questions answered for you later. Thank you so much, Dr. Greer. Great information there. And we do have some questions that people have submitted. Um, one of the questions we got, any tips or tricks or ideas on how to get a mom to eat after a C-section? Yeah, and that can be a little bit tricky. The, the pain medication certainly helps. She's going to feel better if she's on Rimadil or Medicam. Um, the starter mousse can be used not just in her drinking water, but it can be used as a top dressing on the food. I feed bratwurst, and a lot of females don't eat really all that well after their C-section, or in fact, even after vaginal delivery. I think they've been stressed. They've eaten some placentas. It's just a lot going on. So I do a lot of things with starter mousse, with bratwurst, with chicken broth. Um, get out your Instant Pot or your crock pot, throw some chicken leg legs and thighs in the crock pot, cook those up. And then offer them to the female so that she has an opportunity to eat something really yummy. Give her a little bit of ice cream, a little bit of yogurt. Yogurt will help her tummy to feel a little bit better. And within a day or two, they'll start to eat. Sometimes they don't want to leave the puppies either. They're so attached to their brand new puppies that they're like, nope, nope, I'm busy. I can't eat. So sometimes just taking her out of the whelping box, getting her away from them for a few minutes, giving her a place in the kitchen to eat instead of in the kennel can be really helpful as well. Okay, another question we have, do you suggest allowing or encouraging the female to eat the placenta? And if so, how many? Yeah, and if they do, you know, I'm, I let my bitches eat a one or two, but if she's halfway through labor and you end up having to go in and have a C-section, I've actually had bitches vomit up their placentas at the induction of anesthesia at the C-section. So I, 
I tend to be pretty conservative and try to maybe let them eat one or two, but not all of them. If she eats 14 placentas, she's, she's going to be a sick girl. Um, she's going to end up with diarrhea. She's likely to vomit. So try to limit it to just a, a little bit. They really don't need them nutritionally. Um, if you're feeding an appropriate diet of puppy food or performance food, they're going to get plenty of nutrients. Um, remember, bitches ate their placentas to keep predators from coming along and finding their puppies in the den. And I'm guessing most of you don't have a wolf walking through your kennel. So I think that it's probably pretty safe if you just take the placentas and throw them out. But one or two at the most is all I'd let a bitch have. Okay, our next question, um, you talked a lot about Breeders Edge Oxymama, and somebody asked, when do you start giving Oxymama, and what exactly is it? Oxymama is an herbal uh, preparation. It combines fenugreek with some other herbal ingredients that improves lactation, and I'll generally start it if I have a bitch that I know isn't, or a line of bitches I know that aren't great lactating bitches, I'll start it two or three days before they're due. If they tend to already have enough mammary development, you don't want her dripping all her colostrum out before she delivers. So it's going to depend a little bit on the dog. There's not a hard and fast answer. But if she's been on progesterone to keep her pregnant, if she's a bitch from a line of dogs that doesn't lactate well. If you don't think she's going to eat well, then I would start the Oxymama a day or two before she's due. They come as a chewable with a molasses base. And I'll tell you, my dogs would eat the entire bottle. So don't turn your back because if you open it and, you know, she knocks it on the floor and starts to get to it, she, she'll eat She'll eat the whole thing if you give her a chance to. Um, and I'll often give those to the bitch, even though I have my bitches fasting at C-section, I'll often give one or two to the large bitches and let them chew one before we go to surgery if they're not lactating well and we're doing a planned C-section. I want them lactating when they wake up. Okay, we have time for about one more question here. Um, does a scheduled C-section affect the mama's milk production if it's done at day 60 or 61? Doing it at day 60 or 61 is what affects the milk production, not the C-section. So you're going to have puppies born before she's programmed to start lactating. So you may have to give Reglan and Oxymama and your bratwurst and your sweet potatoes, all those things starting at the a day or two before the C-section to improve the chances that she's lactating when the puppies are born. If she isn't lactating, you're going to need to find a way to get plasma or some kind of colostrum into those puppies. So she'll start to lactate on day 63. So the C-section doesn't change the fact that she's not going to lactate, but doing it early will because if her progesterone is still, you know, seven, eight, nine at the C-section, which is okay if they're bulldogs or a bitch that you think is going to get into trouble and you have good timing. I'm just really careful that I make sure I have bitches lactating and I have plasma into those puppies if I don't think they're going to get colostrum because we've got to get colostrum into those puppies or plasma as a substitute in the first eight to 12 hours after they're born. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you so much, Dr. Greer. Great information, as always. So, so much information. Um, <laughs> and we look forward to seeing everybody again. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for coming, everybody.